Well, we're on a great lesson tonight. We're starting up with a personal initiative. And uh, this, uh, this is a great lesson because it's the action-producing portion of this philosophy. It, it wouldn't make very much difference whether you understood all of the other principles or not uh, if you didn't do something about it, now would it? In other words, uh, the value that you're going to get out of this philosophy will not consist of anything that I will say in these lectures, not consist of anything that I put in my notes, nor anything that's in your lessons, or anything that's in any of my textbooks that you'll be reading. That's uh, important, but the important thing is what you will do about all of this. The action you will take to start using this philosophy on your own personal initiative. Now, there are certain things, that, uh, certain attributes of initiative and leadership, and I want you to start in and grade yourself on them. And there are 31 of them. I'm going to make comment on the ones that I consider of greatest importance. Uh, incidentally, this is a grading of yourself on these qualities will be the first step toward making those qualities your own. I don't believe that I need to make much comment on number one, on a definite major purpose, because obviously if you don't have a, an objective in life, a major overall purpose, you have very much personal initiative. And that's one of the most important steps to take, is to find out what it is you want to do. Maybe if, uh, if, you, if you're not sure what you want to do over a lifetime, let's find out what you're going to do this year, the remainder of this year. Let's, uh, let's uh, set our goal not too high, perhaps, but, uh, and not too far in the distance. If you're in a business or a profession or a job, uh, your definite major purpose certainly could uh, enable you to step up your income from uh, your services, whatever your services may be. And then at the end of the year, you can, uh, uh, you can review your record and uh, reestablish your definite major purpose and step it up to something bigger, maybe to a one, another one-year plan or maybe to a five-year plan. But in other words, that's the starting point of, of personal initiative, is to find out where you're going and why, uh, why you're going there, and what you're going to do after you get there, and how much you're going to get out of it uh, uh, financially. You know, the majority of people in this world could be very successful if they would just make up their minds how much success they want and in what terms they want to evaluate success. There are a lot of people in this world who want a, a good position and plenty of money, but they're not quite sure just what kind of a position or what kind of money, how much money they want or when they want to get it. Let's do a little thinking on that subject and uh, grade ourselves on number one. Then on number two, an adequate motive to inspire continuous action in pursuit of the object of one's definite major purpose. Now, study yourself carefully and see if you have an adequate motive or motives. It will be very much better if you have more than one motive for wanting to attain the object of uh, your major purpose, whatever that happens to be, or your immediate purpose. You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, nobody ever does anything without a motive. Well, no, let me restate that. Let me restate that. That's not correct. No one outside of the insane asylum or a person who is off, off balance may do a lot of things without any motive whatsoever, but normal people move only on motive. And the stronger the motive is, the more active they become and the more apt they are to act upon their own personal initiative. You know, you don't have to have an awful lot of brains in this world. You don't have to be very, so very brilliant. You don't have to have such a wonderful education in order to be an outstanding success if you will only take what little you have, whether it's little or much, and start using it, putting it into operation, doing something about it and with it. And of course, that calls for initiative. And number three, a mastermind alliance, that is to say, friendly cooperation, cooperation at least, through which to acquire the necessary power for noteworthy achievement. Uh, take the initiative now and find out just how many friends you have that you can count, uh, call on if you were in need of something in the way of cooperation. Make a list of them. In your notes, make a list of the people that you really and truly could turn to if you needed some favor, if you needed an endorsement, if you needed an introduction, maybe if you needed to make a loan of money. And incidentally, unless you have all the money lying around that you need, the time might come when you need to make a loan. Wouldn't it be very nice to know someone that you could turn to in the case of need and get the money you need? Of course, you can always go to a bank. All you have to do is to give a, a four-for-one security, government bonds, and you can get all the money you want. But there are times when you want uh, medium sums, perhaps, or you want other favors comparable to the borrowing of money. 
And you, you need to have somebody, uh, the acquaintance of somebody cultivated so that when you turn to them for favors, you can get them. But above all, if you are aiming at anything above mediocrity, you need to have a mastermind alliance of one or more people besides yourself who not only will cooperate with you, but who will go out of the way to help you and assist you and who have the ability to do something that will be a benefit, benefit to you. And it's up to you to take the initiative to build those mastermind allies. You know, they don't just come along and join you because uh, you're a good fellow. You have to lay out a plan. You have to have an objective. And uh, you have to find the people suitable to make up your mastermind alliance. And then you have to give them an adequate motive for becoming a, a, a mastermind ally of yours. Now, incidentally, I happen to know that the, the vast majority of people do not have a mastermind alliance with other people. And don't be afraid to grade yourself zero on this one if you don't have one. But uh, next time you come to grade, don't, uh, don't grade zero. Grade higher than that. And uh, the only way you can grade higher if you grade zero now is to start in and find at least one mastermind ally that you can attach yourself to right now, in the beginning. Number four, self-reliance in proportion to the nature of your major purpose. Find out just exactly how much self-reliance you have. <coughs> Incidentally, when you come to check yourself on self-reliance, uh, you may need some help from other people. You may need some help from your wife, or your husband, or your closest friend, or somebody who knows you real well. You may think you have self-reliance, but do you know how you can tell about how much self-reliance you have? Would you be interested in knowing how you can check that very accurately? Yeah, yeah. All right, go back up there to number one and uh, carefully evaluate your definite major purpose and see just how big that is. Or if you have a definite major purpose, and if you don't have one, or if it's not outstanding and above anything that you've attained up to the present, then you don't have very much self-reliance, and you should grade very low on that. If you have the proper amount of self-reliance, you step your definite major purpose up way beyond anything you have ever achieved before, and you'll become determined to attain it. Number five, self-discipline, sufficient to ensure mastery of the head and the heart, and to sustain one's motives until they are realized. Uh, where and when do you need self-discipline most, do you think? When you're on the way up and when everything's rosy and going well and you're succeeding? Is that when you need it? <laughs> I thought you'd call me on that one. <laughs> That's right. You need self-discipline when things are, when the going is hard, when the outlook is not favorable. What kind of self-discipline do you need at that point? Why, you need discipline over your mind to the extent that you know where you're going, uh, you know that you have a right to go there, and you know that you're in determined to go there regardless of how hard the going may be or how much opposition you may meet with. And you'll uh, need at least enough self-discipline uh, to sustain you through the period when the going is hard instead of quitting or complaining. And number six, persistence based on the will to win. Uh, do you know how many times the average person has to fail before he quits or decides he wants to do something else? Once. Once? Don't you think you're generous? <laughs> Once? <laughs> Did you ever hear of the fellow who fails before he starts because he knows that he, there's no use in starting because he knows he can't do a thing? Did you ever hear of him? Well, that cuts it down below one. <laughs> you see? And would you be interested in knowing that the vast majority of people fail before they start? They, they actually never make a start. They think of things that they might do, but they never do anything about it. And did you know also that a vast majority of the people, even though they do start, uh, at the first opposition they quit or allow themselves to be diverted over to something else? I wonder, it just occurs to me to ask a question, I wonder if, if you who have been here close to me and where we've taken our hair down and talking frankly, I wonder if you know what my my outstanding asset it happens to be. Never give up. Will to win. <laughs> Will to win. Well, uh, yeah, you're getting hot. <laughs> I have persistence and the, uh, the will to win and also the, uh, the self-discipline with which to stick to a thing the hard, all the harder when the going is the hardest. Now, that is my outstanding quality. It always has been. It always will be. And I want to tell you, without those traits, 
I never would have uh, completed this philosophy. I never would have been able to uh, have it introduced as widely as it has been. And I wouldn't be standing here talking to you tonight. And what about that trait? Is that something you're born with or is it something that you can acquire? Well, if you couldn't acquire it, there'd be no use of talking about this lesson, would there? Certainly you can acquire it. And it's not very difficult at that. What is it that causes a person to be uh, persistent, by the way? Motive. Yes, motive. Burning desire. Do you know what a burning desire is? Yes. Burning desire, or back of a motive, is what makes people persistent, isn't it? A burning desire, back of a motive. I never think of persistence and a burning desire that I don't uh, think of my courtship. I remember that I put more persistence and more burning desire back of my courtship than anything else that I ever went into in my life. And uh, I want to tell you, without that, I don't think you get very far in a courtship. Well, don't you think you could transmute that, uh, that emotion over to, to something else, putting it back of your uh, business or your profession or your job? and have just as much emotional feeling about attaining success in your job as you could about selling yourself to the one of your choice. Don't you think you could do that? You know what that word transmute means, by the way? Do you? What does it mean? Fine. Fine. Marvelous. Have you ever tried it on anything or anybody? Marvelous. Marvelous. If you haven't tried it, start trying it. Next time you feel moody or discouraged, try to change that over into a, an emotion of courage and faith. You see what a marvelous uh, thing happens to you. You change the whole chemistry of your whole brain and your whole body, and you'll be much more effective. And number seven is a well-developed faculty of the imagination, controlled and directed. Uh, do you think those last words there are important? Yeah. Yes, an imagination not controlled and directed might be very dangerous. I once uh, made a, a survey, made an analysis of all of the men in the federal penitentiaries of the United States. I did that for the Department of Justice. And you'll be interested in knowing that the majority of the men in the penitentiary were there because they had too much imagination. <laughs> but it was not controlled and directed in a constructive uh, direction. Now. Imagination is a marvelous thing, but if you don't have it under control and if you don't direct it to definite ends, constructive ends, it may be very dangerous to you. And number eight, the habit of forming definite and prompt decisions. By the way, do you do that? Do you form definite and prompt decisions when you have all of the facts in hand with which to make decisions? Yes. Well, I think some of you are just a little bit too modest. Well, uh, seriously, friends. If you do not have the habit of making decisions promptly and definitely, clear cut decisions, when uh, all of the facts are in, you're uh, loafing on the job, you're procrastinating, and you're destroying this very vital thing called uh, personal initiative. One of the finest uh, places to, take, uh, to start practicing personal initiative is to learn to make decisions firmly and definitely and quickly when once you have all of the facts available. Now, I'm not talking about snap judgments. I'm not talking about uh, opinions or snap judgments based upon half-baked uh, evidence. I'm talking about facts, all of the facts on a given subject, which are not in, in your hands and available. You should then do something with those facts. You should make up your mind exactly what you're going to do and not dilly-dally around, as so many people do. Because if you do that, uh, first thing you know, you will be in the habit of dilly-dallying around in connection with everything. In other words, you will not be a person who acts upon his own personal initiative. And number... <laughs> the habit of basing opinions on facts instead of relying on guesswork. How many of you do that? How many of you rely upon the... the facts instead of uh, guesswork. Well, pretty truthful bunch, I think. <laughs> I wonder if you do. I, I wonder if you recognize how many times you are, uh, you're acting on guesswork in comparison with the number of times that you're acting upon facts in forming your opinions. I wonder if you recognize the importance of uh, making it your business to get at facts before you 
form an opinion about anything. Did you know that you have no right to an opinion about anything at any time, anywhere, unless it's based upon facts or what you believe to be facts? Did you know that? And why is that true? Would you tell me why you don't have a right to do that? Because you don't want to get into trouble. You don't want to fail. That's why. <laughs> Of course, you can go ahead and uh, have opinions, and we all do, a bunch, a flock of them. You can even give them to somebody else without them asking for them, and we do that right along. But before you really and truly have, can safely express an opinion or have one, you must make, do a certain amount of research and base your opinion upon facts or what you believe to be facts. Now we'll come down to this enthusiasm one, number 10. The capacity to generate enthusiasm at will and control it. Do you know how to generate enthusiasm at will? Act. Do it. Feel it. Five. Uh, what, what's back of all this? What happens before you start doing anything in connection with enthusiasm? Yes, you, uh, you have to feel it, don't you? You have to feel the emotion. of. You have to be quickened, and your mind has to be alerted with some definite objective or purpose or motive. And then uh, you do something about that motive. You do it with words, with the expression of your face, or by some other form of action. That word action is inseparable from uh, the, the word enthusiasm. You can't separate the two. Now, there are two kinds of enthusiasm. There's passive enthusiasm, where enthusiasm which you feel, but you give no expression of it whatsoever. And there are times when you need that kind, believe you me. Because if you don't have that kind, uh, you disclose to other people what goes on in your mind at times when you don't want that to happen. You take a great leader, a great executive, and uh, while he may have a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, he'll, he'll display that enthusiasm only to whom he, soever he pleases and under whatsoever circumstances he pleases. He will not just turn it on and go off and leave it. That's the way you and I do it. <laughs> or do we? That's the way the majority of people do. When they have enthusiasm, they just turn it on and blubber over in it, and they accomplish nothing. Controlled enthusiasm, enthusiasm turned on at the right time and then turned off at the right time is an important thing, and your initiative is the only thing that can control that. You know, if you took that one subject alone, the question of how to turn on and on off enthusiasm, and got the art down fine, you could become a marvelous salesman of anything you might want to sell. Did you know that? You really could. Did you ever hear of anybody selling anything that didn't have, feel enthusiasm over what he's trying to sell? Did you? Did you ever sell anything that you didn't have that feeling of enthusiasm over what you were trying to do for the other fellow? You may have thought you did, but you didn't. If you didn't have that feeling of enthusiasm on your own initiative, then you didn't make a sale. Somebody may have bought something from you because he needed it and had to have it, but you had very little to do with it unless you had that feeling that you imparted to him. And how do you impart the feeling of enthusiasm to another person? How do you do that when you're selling, for instance? Fine. Must be sold on it yourself. That's a very good way of putting it. In other words, it's, it starts inside of your own emotional makeup. You must feel that way. And uh, if you open your mouth to speak, you must speak with enthusiasm. You must put some enthusiasm into your, uh, the expression of your face. Put on a smile, a good broad one. Because nobody speaks with enthusiasm with a frown on his face. They do, the two just don't go together, do they? No, they don't. So there are a lot of things that you must learn about this business of expressing enthusiasm if you're going to make the most of it, and all of them involve your personal initiative. You've got to do it. Nobody can do it for you. I can't tell you how to be enthusiastic. I can tell you what are the component parts of enthusiasm and how to express it, but after all, the job of actually expressing it is up to you. Let's pass on down to number 12, a tolerance. Uh, do you know what tolerance is? What is it? Open mind on what? How many of you are open-minded on everything? Come on. <laughs> You really think you are? <laughs> I'd hate to tell you how far off you are on that one. 
because you're friends of mine and I want to keep you that way. <laughs> open-minded on all subjects, I've, I'll admit that I'm not. I'm not open-minded on all subjects. I'm open-minded on a lot of subjects, the ones I want to be open-minded on. <laughs> but we shouldn't. We shouldn't have any attitude toward anybody under any circumstances unless it's based upon something to justify that attitude or what we believe to justify it, at least. You, do you have any idea how much, you, uh, how much value do you deprive yourselves of all the way through life just because you close your mind against somebody you don't like when the, that person might be the most beneficial person in the world to you if you only had an open mind toward him? Did you know that one of, the, uh, one of the costliest things in an industrial or a business organization is the closed minds of the people that work there? Did you know that? If you don't know that, I want you to find it out. It's the most costly thing in any business organization or in any industry is the closed minds of the people who work there, closed toward one another, closed toward opportunities, closed toward the people they serve, and closed toward themselves. Uh, when you speak of intolerance, you often think of um, uh, somebody who doesn't like the other fellow because of his religion or his politics. Well, that's just a, that doesn't scratch the surface of the real meaning of this subject of, of intolerance. It extends to almost every human relationship. And unless you do maintain, form the habit of maintaining an open mind on all subjects, toward all people, at all times, You'll never be a great thinker. You'll never have a great magnetic personality. And you certainly will never be very well liked unless you do have an open mind. <clears throat> Did you know that you can be very frank with people whom you don't like and who do not like you? If they know that you're sincere and that you're speaking with an open mind, did you know that? The one thing that people will not tolerate is to recognize that they're talking to somebody whose mind is already closed and what they're saying has no effect whatsoever, regardless of how, how much value there is to it or how much truth there is to it. And there are a lot of people in this world whose minds are so definitely closed on so many things that you couldn't crack the mind with a sledgehammer and you couldn't get an ounce of truth in there if you lived a hundred years. They're just closed up tight, sealed, hermetically sealed. Number 13, the habit of doing more than you're paid for always. How many do that? Let me have your hands. <laughs> What's the matter with the ones who don't? Is there anything wrong with this habit? Of <laughs> oh, that word always. <laughs> All right, let's leave it off. How many of you follow the habit of, do, of rendering more service and better service than you paid to render? Part of the time. Part of the time. Well, that's more like it. <laughs> that's more like it. So that's something in connection with which you certainly have to move on your personal initiative. Nobody's going to tell you to do that. Nobody's going to expect you to do that. That's something that's uh, entirely within your own prerogative. But incidentally, it's probably one of the most important and one of the most profitable sources through which you can exercise your own personal initiative. If I had to pick out the time and the place and the circumstance under which you could make use of your personal initiative most beneficially, undoubtedly, it would be in connection with your following the habit of rendering more service and better service than your paid to render. Because you don't have to ask anybody for the privilege of doing that. And also, if you do follow that habit, not just do it once in a while, that, that's not so very effective, but follow the habit. Sooner or later, the uh, law of increasing returns begins to pile up uh, dividends for you, and when, it, when the dividends come back, they come back greatly multiplied. I want to tell you that when you start living by this principle of going the extra mile, you can expect unusual things to happen to you, and they'll all be pleasant, every one of them. And number 14, tactfulness and a keen sense of diplomacy. How many of you have tactfulness and a keen sense of diplomacy? Let me see your hands on that one. Well, now, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> that is pretty good. Well, now, let's, uh, maybe that definition is a little too broad. How many of you are tactful in, in your conversations with people, just the ordinary conversations? Tactful. Well, that's pretty good. 
Um, what do you think about this business of being tactful? Is it worth the time it takes to be tactful, do you think? Yes. You think it is? Why? That's right. Now you're getting at you. Get the cooperation of others more easily if you're tactful. You come in and tell me that I've got to do something, and I say, well, maybe now just a minute. Just a minute. Maybe I do have to do something, but if you put it to me that way, I'm going to set up some resistance right away. But if you come in and say to me, uh, I would very greatly appreciate it if you would do something, but you knew in the first place that you had a right to demand on me, but you didn't put it that way. One of the most impressive things that I learned from Andrew Carnegie at the very beginning of my association with him was that he never commanded anybody to do anything. Never. No matter who the man was that he requested to do something, uh, he never asked, he never commanded him. He always asked him if he would do a certain thing. Would you please do a certain thing? Or will you do the other thing? And it's surprising the amount of loyalty that Mr. Carnegie had from his men. They'd uh, go out of their way for him any time of the day or night because of his tactfulness in dealing with them. And when it was necessary for him to discipline one of them, he usually invited him out to the house, gave him a nice state dinner, a real uh, five or six course dinner, really put on the dog. And then after dinner, they showed out and came when they went over to the library. And he'd start asking questions. One of his uh, chief secretaries was scheduled to become a member of his mastermind group. And uh, this boy found out that he was scheduled to, for promotion, and it went to his head, and he commenced to run around with a bunch of high binders in Pittsburgh, people who throw cocktail parties and such. And just in a little while, he was taking too much liquor, staying out too late. His eyes were hanging out on his cheeks when he'd come in in the morning. And Mr. Carnegie let this go on for about three months. And he got invited out one evening to dinner. And after dinner was over, they went into the library. Mr. Carnegie said, now, <clears throat> uh, I'm sitting over there in uh, your chair, and you're sitting over here in my chair. I want to know what you would do if you were in my place. And you had a man scheduled to, for an important promotion, and all of a sudden it seemed to have gone to his head. Started running around with fast company, staying out late at night, drinking too much liquor, paying too much attention to everything except his job. What in the world would you do in the case of that kind? I, I'm anxious to know. And this young man said, Mr. Carnegie, I know you're going to fire me, so you might just as well start and get it over with. <laughs> Mr. Carnegie said, oh no. Oh, no. If I'd wanted to fire you, I wouldn't have given you a nice dinner and I wouldn't have brought you out to my house. So I could have done that down at the office. No, I'm not going to fire you. I'm just going to have you ask yourself a question and see whether or not you're not about in the position to fire yourself. Maybe you are. Maybe you're closer to it than you realize. That man right about faced and did become one of Mr. Carnegie's mastermind group and did become a millionaire later on. It, it absolutely saved him from himself. Mr. Carney's tactfulness was out of this world. He knew how to handle men. He knew how to get them to examine themselves. Uh, it doesn't do much good for me to examine you, but it might do a lot of good if you examined yourself in connection with your faults and in connection with your virtues. Self-analysis is one of the most important forms of personal initiative that you can possibly engage in. Self-analysis. I. Never let a day go by that I don't examine myself to see where I've fallen down, to where I'm weak, where I can make improvements, what I could do to render more service and better service. Lord, I examine myself every day. And believe you me, this has been going on for a great number of years. And even today, I, I can always find some place where I can improve, where I can do something better or something more. It's a very healthy form of personal initiative. Well, I, I'll assure you, and it's very interesting, too. Because you finally get down to where you'll be honest with yourself. Do you have any idea how many people there are who are dishonest with themselves? It's the, it's the worst form of dishonesty that I know anything about at all. Creating alibis in your own mind to support your acts and your deeds and your thoughts. Instead of examining yourself and finding out why you're weak and then bridging those weaknesses or getting somebody in your master mind to alliance to bridge them for you. Now that's a personal initiative too, 
And it's the kind of personal initiative that most people want to engage in because it involves uh, self-analysis and self-criticism. Well, which would you rather have? Would you rather have an outsider criticize you and point out your faults, or would you rather criticize yourself and find them? Why? Well, you can be kind of uh, you can be kind of confidential about it. You don't have to publicize these weaknesses that you find out, and you can get them corrected before anybody else finds out about them. If you do do a good job, but if you wait until somebody else has to call them to your attention, then they become public property, don't they? And uh, they may embarrass you. They may uh, hurt your pride. They may even cause you to build up an inferiority complex if you wait for the other fellow to have to point out your weaknesses to you. That's personal initiative, too. Finding out what your weak spots are, what it is that causes you to be disliked by other people, why it is you're not getting ahead as well as some of the other people, and why you know you've got just as much brains or even more than they have. Another marvelous place to uh, take the personal initiative is, uh, is to compare yourself with other people who are succeeding beyond your success. Make comparisons and analyses and to see what it is they have that you don't have. You'll be surprised to find out how much you can learn from the other fellow. Maybe the fellow you don't like very well either. You can learn something from him. If he's ahead of you, if he's doing better than you are, believe you me, you can always learn something from the man who's doing better than you're doing. Sometimes you can learn something from the fellow who's not doing as well as you're doing, too. It works both ways. You may find out why he's not doing as well. Number 15, the habit of listening much and talking only when necessary. I wonder how many of you listen more than you talk. Would you give me your hands? And I have never yet heard of anybody learning anything while he's talking. <laughs> except that maybe he might learn to uh, not talk so much. <laughs> well, uh, now this seems kind of funny, but it's not funny, it's very serious. The vast majority of people do a lot more talking than they do listening, and uh, they seem dead bit on getting the other fellow told off instead of listening to see what the other fellow has to say that they might profit by. Listening much and talking when necessary. Think first and talk last. And 16, a well-developed sense of observation of details. How many of you feel that you have a keen sense of observation of details? How many of you feel that you could walk down State Street here or any of these streets in front of uh, uh, Marshall Fields, just casually walk by, and then uh, after you got at the end of the block, give a very accurate description of everything you saw in the window? Think you could do that? I once belonged to a class in Philadelphia directed by a man who was, who was teaching us the importance of observation of small details. Because he said it was the little details that made up the successes and the failures of life. Not the big ones at all, the little, little ones. The ones we usually pass aside as not being important or that we do not even observe. And as a part of our training, he took us out of the, out of the hall and took us down the, the street one block crossed over the street, came up one block, and back into the hall, and in doing so, we passed about ten stores, one of which was a hardware store, and in that hardware store window, I would say there was easily 500 articles. And he asked each one of us to take a, a pad, of, a paper, and a pencil along, now mind you, giving us a crutch for our memory, and to put down the things that we saw as we passed along that we thought were important. And guess how many was the greatest number of things that, 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 that any of us put down going two blocks, one block down this way, across and up the other side, and covering at least 20 stores. Guess how many was the, uh, the greatest number of things that, the, uh, that any of us saw? <laughs> You'll be surprised. The greatest number of, of things that anybody had down was 56. And when this man came back, he didn't have any paper, and no pencil. He listed 746 and described each one of them and told what window it was in and what part of the window it was in. 
I, did, I didn't accept it. I, I had to go down after the class was over and double uh, backtracked him and checked it. And he was absolutely 100% accurate. In other words, he had trained himself to observe details, not just a few of them, but all of them. And believe you me, a good executive, a good leader, a good anything is a person who uh, observes all the things that are happening around him, the good things and the bad things, the positives and the negatives. He doesn't just happen to notice those things that interest him. He notices everything that may interest him or may affect his interests. Attention to details. Number 18, the capacity to stand criticism without resentment. How many of you can do that? Come on, give me your hands. Now I'm going to test you another way. How many of you invite criticism, from uh, that is friendly criticism, from other people? How many of you invite it? Uh, you're overlooking a bit there, my friends, those of you who didn't vote. You're overlooking a big bet. Because one of the finest things that could possibly happen is to have a regular source a friendly criticism of the thing that you're doing in life, the thing that, that thing that constitutes your major purpose at least. I invite it because the things that you're doing daily that may offend other people, you think they're all right or you wouldn't be doing them. And you're going to keep on doing them if somebody doesn't call them to your attention. Is that right? So you need a source of friendly criticism. It's one of the most marvelous things in the world. I'm not talking about these people who don't like you and criticize you just because they don't like you. That's no good. I wouldn't have they, let that have any effect on me whatsoever. And on the other hand, I wouldn't pay too, many, too much attention to the person who gives me friendly criticism just because he loves me. <laughs> you know, you can do yourself just as much damage that way. I, I've heard it said out in Hollywood that uh, those stars out there, when they begin to believe they're press agents, and sometimes they do, they're just about through. That's right. Well, you need to have the privilege, ladies and gentlemen, of looking at yourselves through the eyes of other people. You need that privilege. Yeah, we all need it. Because I'll assure you, when you walk down the street, you won't look the same to the other fellow that sees you as you think you look to yourself. And when you open your mouth and speak in conversation or otherwise, you don't, uh, the, what registers in the other mind, man's mind is not always what you think is registering at all. You need criticism. You need analysis. You need people to point out to you changes that you ought to make, because we all have to make changes as we go along. If we didn't, we wouldn't grow. But did you know that the majority of people resent any kind of suggestion or criticism whatsoever that uh, differs from what they're doing? Anything at all that would change their way of doing things, they resent it. And consequently, they do themselves great damage by resenting. Friendly criticism. Someone has said that <laughs> there's no such thing as constructive criticism. I, I can't buy that. I think there is such a thing as constructive yeah. criticism. I think it's wonderful. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Just remember that no matter what you're doing, who you are, how well you do it, you'll never get a hundred percent approval from the from the crowd. Don't expect it, and don't be disturbed too much if you don't get it. Loyalty number twenty. Loyalty to all to whom loyalty is due. Loyalty comes at the top of the list in my book of rules of qualifications of people that I want to be associated with. If you don't have loyalty to the people that have a right to your loyalty, you don't have anything. No matter how brilliant you are, how, how sharp or smart, how well educated, the smarter you are, the more dangerous you may be. If you don't have loyalty, if you can't be loyal to the people that you have or, that have a right to your loyalty. How many of you are loyal to the people that you're supposed to be? Well, that's grand. That's grand. I don't mean to make any of you tell lies, and I'm sure you wouldn't. But I just want you to check up. You see, when you start voting on something, before you do it, usually speaking, you stop to think, well, now, do I have loyalty? Do I? And if you don't have it, why, well, you think of the, of the person in connection with which you don't have that loyalty, and you decide maybe to do something about it. Now, the, I have loyalty to people that I don't even like. But I do have a sense of obligation to them if I'm related to them in business or professionally or otherwise. Or in, in the family circle, there are a few people there that I don't particularly like. But I'm loyal to them because it's, uh, I have that obligation. 
If they want to be loyal to me, that's all right. If they don't, that's their misfortune, not mine. I have the privilege of being loyal, and I'm going to live up to that privilege because of the values I get out of it, because I have to live with this fellow. I have to sleep with him. I have to look in the mirror every morning and shave his face. I have to give him a bath every once in a while. And, you know, I have to be on good terms with him. You can't live with a fellow that closely and not be on good terms with him. To thine own self be true, and it must follow as night to day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And Shakespeare never wrote anything more beautiful and more philosophical than that. To your own self be true. Be loyal to yourself, because you have to live with self. And if you're loyal to yourself, the chances are you'll be loyal to your friends and your business associates. And number 23, the necessary attractiveness of personality to, to induce cooperation. How about this uh, business of um, an attractive personality? Is it something you're born with, or uh, is it something that you must do about on your own initiative? You can acquire it. There's only one trait, only one of the 25 factors that go to make up an attractive personality that, you, uh, that you're born with, or not born with, as the case may be. Only one. Personal magnetism. And you can even do something about that. And certainly all of these other 24 factors, uh, you can do something about every one of them, because they're everyone subject to cultivation through what? Personal initiative, of course. You've got to do it yourself. First of all, you've got to know uh, how you stand on each of these points. You've got to know how you stand, and you can't always uh, take your own word for it. You've got to get your wife or your husband or somebody else to tell you. Sometimes you, make an, uh, you have an enemy, and he'll tell you where you fall down. It's, did you know that enemies were good things to have once in a while? <laughs> Why? <laughs> of course. Believe you me, they don't pull punches. And if you'll examine what your enemies or those who do not like you say about you, the chances are that you might learn something of value. If nothing else, you'll learn to at least to uh, see to it that you don't let them tell the truth about you. Whatever they say is not correct because you're going to be so straight in the road that whatever they say about you derogatory is not going to be true. That's an advantage, isn't it? So don't be afraid of enemies. Don't be afraid of people who don't like you. Because they may say things that uh, put you on the track uh, of discovery of something that you need to know about yourself. I had a salesman come in to see me some years ago, and he said that he had been with his company about 10 years. And he had made a wonderful record, had several promotions, and was up in the big money. And all of a sudden, six months previously, his sales began to go down. People, customers that he used to call on, that used to give him the business, would frown on him. And uh, I noticed when he came in that he had one of these big Texas 10-gallon hats on. I said, by the way, how long have you had that hat? Well, he said, I got it about six months ago down in Texas. Well, I said, listen, fellow, uh, are you selling in Texas? He said, no, I don't, I don't make Texas very often. I said, oh, listen, you wear that hat only when you go down in Texas, because they don't like that hat. It doesn't look good on you. Well, he said, would that make any difference? I said, you'd be surprised what a difference it'll make, your personal appearance. Some people just don't like the way you look, and they won't do business with you. Yes, you can do something about your personality. You can find out the traits that you have that irritate other people, and you can, do, uh, you can correct those traits. But you uh, have to do it yourself. You have to make the discovery yourself, or you have to get somebody who's frank enough to do it for you. And then number 24, the capacity to concentrate full attention upon one subject at a time. When you start to make a point, exploit it right down to its final analysis and make a climax and then get on to your next point. Don't try to cover too many points at one time. If you do, you'll not cover any points at all. I wonder how many of you have been making that mistake in your relations with other people and in selling and in public speaking or whatever you're doing. It used to be one of my most outstanding weaknesses. I used to do just that very thing. And I had a man come to me and call that to my attention. And I think uh, no training that I ever had in public speaking was as valuable as that, uh, and it was for free. He didn't charge me anything for it. He said, you have a wonderful command of English. You have a marvelous uh, capacity for enthusiasm. You have a tremendously big store of, of illustrations that are interesting. But he said, you have a bad habit of taking off after something out there that's not related to the points you're making and then coming back later on picking up the point. Meantime, it's gotten cold. You see? Well, grade yourself on that 
capacity to concentrate full attention upon one subject at a time, whether you're speaking or whether you're thinking or whether you're writing or teaching, whatever you do, let's concentrate on one thing at a time. And then on the habit of learning from your mistakes. If you don't learn from your mistakes, why, you might just as well not make them. <laughs> that isn't a truism, tell me what is. <laughs> I never, I never see a man duplicating a mistake over and over again that I don't think of that old Chinese uh, aphorism. If a man uh, fool me once, shame on the man. But if you fool me twice, shame on me. <laughs> there are a lot of people that should say shame on me because they just don't seem to learn from mistakes at all. And uh, number 26, a willingness to accept full responsibility for the mistakes of one's subordinates. If you have subordinates and they make mistakes, it's you who have uh, failed and not the subordinates. Remember that, will you? Either train him how to do the thing right or else uh, put him in some other job where you won't have to supervise him. Let somebody else do that. But the responsibility is yours if the person working under you is subordinate to you. Number 27, the habit of adequately recognizing the merits and abilities of others. Don't try to steal the thunder from the other fellow. If he's done a good job, give him full credit. Give him double credit. Give him more than he's entitled to, rather than less. And a little pat on the back has never been known to hurt anybody when, he, when you know he has done a good job. The most successful people like recognition, and sometimes people work harder for recognition than they will for anything else. Some people are incorruptible, you know, no matter how, you can't overflatter them because they know what their capacity is. If you go beyond that, they, uh, they begin to be suspicious of it. Most people, are, however, I believe are corruptible when it comes to this business of flattery. You can, over, <laughs> you can overflatter them and they kind of believe it. And that's bad for them and for you too. There was a book written that was widely distributed all over this country. And the central theme in that book was, if you want to get along in the world, flatter people. Well, flattery is as old as the world. It's one of the most deadly and one of the oldest weapons and one of the most dangerous. Now, I like approbation. I like those five people that, uh, that happened to know me and complimented me. I, I enjoyed it. But if they'd gone, if one of them had followed me out and said, well, Mr. Hill, I, I, I appreciate all that you've uh, done for me and all that sort of thing. But uh, by the way, uh, uh, would you mind if I came around the house tonight? I'd like to talk to you about a business proposition. <laughs> you see, uh, right away, I just said, well, now he's flattered me in order that he may get some of my time and he may get some benefits from me. So too much flattery, too much commendation is not so good either. Well, anyhow, a positive mental attitude at all times, 29, but I wanted to call your attention to number 28, the habit of applying the golden rule principle in all human relationships. I'm not going to ask you to vote on that one. I'm only going to call your attention to the fact that one of the finest things you can do for yourself is to put yourself in the other fellow's position when you go to make any decision or engage in any transaction involving the other fellow. Just put yourself in the other fellow's position before you make a final decision. And if you do that, the chances are that you'll always do the fair thing by the other man. Number 30, the habit of assuming full responsibility for any task that you've undertaken. Not coming back with an alibi. Did you know the one thing at which the uh, majority of people are the most apt and most adept in doing? Alibi. Alibi. My, oh, my, oh, my. <clears throat> Alibis. Creating a reason why they didn't succeed or didn't get the job done or didn't do the thing. If the majority of people who create alibis would put half as much time into doing the thing right or trying to do it right that they put into explaining why they didn't do it, you know, they'd get a lot farther in life and be much better off. And generally speaking, the man who is the most clever at creating an alibi is the most inefficient man in the whole works. They make a profession of spinning alibis. They will think them up in advance so that if they are called on the carpet or get caught over the barrel, they have an answer. There's only one thing that counts, and that's the success. Results is, are what count. Results. I once wrote an epigram covering this subject that I thought was very effective. Success requires no explanations 
failure permits no alibis. In other words, if it's a success, you don't need any explanations. And if it's a failure, you all the alibis and explanations in the world won't do any good. It's still a failure, isn't it? Yeah. And number 31, the habit of keeping the mind occupied with that which one desires and not with that which one does not want. You know, the uh, vast of majority of instances in which uh, people engage in personal initiative is in connection with the things they don't want. Had you ever thought of that? Now there is one place where most people don't have to be taught to take the personal initiative. They really work at it. Work at thinking about all the things they don't want and that's precisely what they get out of life. The things that they think about. Things that they attune their minds to. Now there's a little play, other place where that word transmute can come into play. Instead of thinking about the things you don't want, the things you fear, the things you distrust, the things you dislike, think about all the things you like, all the things you want, and all the things you're going to become determined to get. I must tell you something that happened last uh, Saturday. I went down to the travel agency to get my um, ticket changed so I could come back on Monday instead of Sunday. When I walked in, the... Uh, manager of the travel agency grabbed my hand when he saw who I was and introduced himself and started in to sell me think and grow rich. <laughs> in a little while, uh, while he still had hold of my hand talking to me, a man came in, a friend of his, who was connected with one of the airlines, and he heard the name Napoleon Hill and he grabbed the other hand <laughs> and started to sell me think and grow rich. And he said, you may be interested in knowing that before I went with the, air con the airline, I had a sales organization with approximately a hundred people and I required every salesman to have all of your books. That was a must. Well, I felt pretty good. As I started out, there were two very nice looking young ladies standing on the sidewalk giving out uh, election literature. And as I passed by, one of them said, say, aren't you Napoleon Hill? I turned around and uh, bowed. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> Who are you? She said, well, I was at a woman's club about two years ago when you delivered an address, and this is my cousin here. Both of our husbands are very successful now due to the fact they have read your books. I went on over to my car, and the policeman was making out a ticket. You see all this talk? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is the payoff. I put a penny in there, thinking that would uh, 12 minutes would be all I would be in there, but all of this nice uh, conversation that I was getting, uh, I stopped to bathe my vanity in it. And when I got there, this policeman was making out the ticket. He had it about halfway made out. And I walked up to him, of course, he didn't know who the car was. I walked up to him, I said, now you wouldn't do that to Napoleon Hill, would you? He said, who? I said, Napoleon Hill. He said, no, I wouldn't do that to Napoleon Hill, but I certainly would do it to you. <laughs> well, I, I introduced myself. I took out my credit card and handed it to him and my driver's license. And he said, well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. He took the uh, tab and tore it up. And he said, uh, we just forget about that. And he said, you may be interested in knowing that I'm on the Glendale Police Force as a result of reading your book, Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> well, the subject now is a positive mental attitude. I want you to, I want to call your attention to the fact that uh, nothing constructive and worthy of man's efforts ever has been or ever will be achieved except that which comes from a positive mental attitude based on definiteness of purpose and a activated by a burning desire and intensified until the burning desire is elevated to the plane of applied faith. Now here are five steps, five different conditions of the mind, all of which lead up to a positive mental attitude. Take number one, for instance, wishes. Everybody has a stock of wishes. They wish for this, and they wish for that, and they wish for the other thing. We all have wishes. Well, uh, Nothing very much happens when uh, you just wish for things, does it? No. no. Nothing happens. Well, uh, then you uh, go a little bit further and you become uh, curious. Uh, you put in a lot of time uh, through idle curiosity. And do you think anything ever happens worthwhile in connection with the expression of idle curiosity? 
However, you can and you do consume a lot, a lot of time oftentimes with idle curiosity, don't you? You put in a lot of time oftentimes just studying the, uh, what your neighbors do or do not do, what your competitors do or do not do, I'll be just out of idle curiosity. Well, that's not it, leading to a positive mental attitude. Then, uh, a step above that, uh, you have hopes. Your wishes now have taken on a more concrete form. They become hopes, hopes of achievement, hopes of attainment, hope of accomplishment, hopes of accumulation of things that you want. Well, uh, just a hope by itself is not very effective, is it? Because we all have a, a, a block of hopes, but not all of us who have hopes have success. We just hope for success. It is, however, better than wishing for it, isn't it? Well, what is the difference between a hope and a wish? Well, yes, that's right. Uh, a hope is uh, taking on, it's beginning to take on the nature of faith, isn't it? That's the idea. You're, you're transmuting a wish into uh, that very desirable state of mind known as faith. Then you come on, uh, you step up your mental attitude to where uh, your hopes are transmuted into something else known as a burning desire. Now, is there any difference between a burning desire and an ordinary desire? Yes. That's right. A burning desire is an intensified desire based upon hope, based upon definiteness of purpose. How does uh, one go about uh, Developing a burning desire for anything. <laughs> if I didn't know the answer to this, believe me, I could get me a flock of answers here, couldn't I? <laughs> That's fine. Well, a burning desire is an obsessional desire, isn't it? And it certainly, you cannot have a burning desire without a motive or motives back of it, can you? Wouldn't it be interesting if you, kept, if you kept a tabulation for two or three days of the exact amount of time you put in thinking about the no-can-do side of life and the can-do side, or the positive side, the negative side? You might be astounded if even the most successful people would be astounded to find out how many hours they put in each day in negative thinking. And the very outstanding successes in the world, the great leaders are the ones that put in very little, if any time, in thinking on the negative side. They put in all of the time thinking on the positive side. I once asked Henry Ford if there was anything in the world he wanted or wanted to do that he couldn't do. And he said, no, he didn't believe there was. I asked him if there ever had been. He said, oh, yes, back in the early days before he had learned how to use his mind. And I said, well, now, just what do you mean by that? Well, he said, now... When I want a thing, I want to do a thing, I start in finding out what I can do about it, and I start doing that, and I don't bother about what I can't do, because I just let that alone. <laughs> that was a homely statement, but I want to tell you, there's a world of philosophy wrapped up in that statement. He put his mind into doing something about the part that he could do something about, and thinking about that, and not about the part that he couldn't do anything about. I venture the suggestion that if you put a problem to the majority of people, a problem, a difficult problem, they will immediately begin to tell you all of the reasons why the problem can't be solved. And if there are some things about the problem that are favorable and some that are unfavorable, the majority of people will see the things that are unfavorable first and oftentimes never see the favorable side. I don't believe there are any problems in connection with which you can't do something in connection with, in connection with which there are not some favorable sides to. I can't think of a single problem that, that could confront me that, I, that wouldn't have a favorable side to it. If nothing else, the favorable side would consist in the fact that I would say that if it's a problem I can solve, I, I will solve it, and if it's a problem I can't solve, I'll not worry about it. And that's something. But the majority of people, when they're confronted with difficult propositions or problems uh, that they can't solve, they start worrying. And then they go into what kind of a state of mind? Negative state of mind. And do you ever accomplish anything worthwhile when you're in that state of mind? No. No, you don't. You're only muddying the water when you make your mind negative. You never accomplish anything worthwhile. You have to learn to keep your mind positive all the time when you want to do things worthwhile. 
does a positive mental attitude attract uh, opportunities or does it uh, repel them? Attracts. Does a negative mental attitude attract favorable opportunities for you or repel them? It repels them, doesn't it? Definitely. And does that have repelling of opportunities have anything to do with your merit or right to have opportunities? Nothing whatsoever. Absolutely not. You may be just, you may have the right to, uh, to all of the good things in, in life. You may be entitled to them, but if you have a negative mental attitude, you will repel the opportunities leading to the attainment of those things. So your job, Manly, is to uh, keep your mind positive so it will attract to you the things that you want, the things that you desire, the things that you are going after. Had you ever uh, stopped to think why it is that prayer generally doesn't bring anything about but except a negative result? Had you ever stopped to wonder about that? You know, I believe that's the biggest stumbling block of most people in all religions is they don't want, they don't understand why a prayer sometimes brings the negative results, or why it generally brings negative results. Now, you couldn't expect anything else because there's a law that governs that. And the law is that your mind attracts to you the counterpart of the things, of the mind, of the things that the mind is feeding upon. There's no, no exception to that rule. It's a natural law. There's no exceptions for anybody. So if you want to attract through prayer or otherwise the things that you desire, you have to make your mind positive. You not only have to believe, but you have to put action back of that belief and transmute it into a faith, applied faith. And you can't have applied faith in a negative state of mind. The two just don't go together. Constructive mottos are often used by people who recognize what a powerful influence one's daily environment has on the maintenance of a positive mental attitude. The entire industrial plant of the R.G. Laterno Company with 2,000 employees was positivized by placing mottos printed in large letters in all departments and changing them weekly, such as the ones that you see here. Now, those mottos were written for a purpose. Every department in that uh, great sprawling plant of the Turnicum, every department had those mottos replaced there regularly, sometimes daily in the cafeteria and, uh, uh, and in the other departments weekly. And the mottos are written in the letters a half, of the, a half a foot high so that you could read them all the way across the building. And believe you me, every time they walked into their department, well, they uh, saw that, uh, that uh, motto. By the way, we had a funny experience with them. I was standing in the cafeteria one day when the motto was placed up. See, the cafeteria was a place where all the men lined up to get their meals at noon time, and we could catch them all there at one time or another during the day. And the motto read, uh, just remember that uh, your real boss is the one who walks around under your hat. I'd think that would be as plain as mud to anybody that would read it. It would mean that you're, you're the real boss in final analysis. But I heard a man let out an Indian yell. He said, boy, that's what I've always said. I've always known that my foreman was a louse. <laughs> now, up at the top of the page, there is a method by which one may transmute failure into success poverty into riches, sorrow into joy, fear into faith. The transmutation must start with a positive mental attitude because success, riches, and faith do not make bedfellows with a negative mental attitude. The transmutation procedure is simple. Now, here it is. And you can very well afford to come back to this many times and uh, assimilate it and make it your own. Number one, when failure overtakes you, start thinking of it as if it had been a success. Do you think that would be difficult to do? Yeah. you think it would? No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't at all. In other words, thinking of it, uh, what would have happened if it had been a success instead of a failure? Seeing yourself in the success side of the situation and not in the failure side. Start imagining or imaging the circumstances of the failures in your own imagination as being a success. Start also looking for the seed of an equivalent benefit which comes with every failure. And there is where you will be able to transmute the failure into success.
Because every adversity, every failure, and every defeat has the seed of an equivalent benefit. And if you go to searching for that seed, you will not uh, take a negative mental attitude toward the circumstance. You take a positive mental attitude because you're sure to find that seed. You may not find it the first time you look for it, but eventually you will find it if you keep on. That's step number one. Number two, when poverty threatens to catch up with you or has actually caught up, Start thinking of it as riches and visualize the riches in all the things that you would wish to do with actual riches. Also start looking for the seed of an equivalent benefit of poverty. I remember when I was a little boy sitting on the bank of the river down in Wise County where I was born just after my mother was, had died before my stepmother came along. I was hungry. I didn't have enough food. I was sitting there on the bank of the river wondering if I couldn't catch some fish and maybe fry some fish and have something to eat. And as I sat there, I don't know what caused me to do this, but I shut my eyes and looked into the future, and I saw myself going away, becoming famous, wealthy, and coming back to that very spot, charging up the river on a horse, a mechanical horse that was run by steam. I could see the steam pouring out of his nostrils. I could hear his horseshoes clicking on the rocks. It was so, uh, so vivid to me. In other words, I built myself into a state of ecstasy there in that hour of poverty and need and want and hunger. Uh, years passed, and the time came when I drove my Rolls Royce into that very spot, the car that I paid $22,500 for. I, I, I drove my Rolls Royce into the, that very spot. And I went back and imaged again that childhood scene where I had been there in poverty and in want and in hunger. And I said, well, I don't know whether my imaging this back in the early days had anything to do with it or not. Maybe it did. Maybe I kept alive that hope and eventually translated that hope into faith and eventually that faith brought me not only a steam horse but something much more valuable and much more costly than a steam horse. Uh, looking forward and imaging the things that you want to do, transmuting uh, uh, unfavorable circumstances and adversities into something that's pleasant. By that I mean switching your mind away from thinking about the unpleasant things over to something that's pleasant. And then again, number three, when fear overtakes you, just remember that fear is only faith in reverse gear. And start thinking in terms of faith by seeing yourself translating faith into whatever circumstance or things you desire. I don't suppose anybody ever escapes uh, experiencing the seven basic fears at one time or another. And most people uh, experience them all the way through life. But certainly if you allow fear to take possession of you and to grip you, it'll become a habit. And it certainly will attract to you all of the things that you don't want. You have to learn to deal with fear by transmuting it or translating it or transforming it over by, uh, in your mind uh, into something the opposite of fear. In other words, faith. If you fear poverty, commence thinking of yourselves in, you know, in terms of opulence and of money. And thinking of ways and means that you're going to earn that money and acquire it. What you're going to do with it after you get it. Why there's, you can daydream and... Uh, there's no end to the daydreaming you do. And it's far better to daydream about the money you're going to have than it is to fear the poverty that you know you already have. I'll assure you, this is no virtue and no benefit in sitting down and bemoaning the fact that you are poverty-stricken or that you need money and you don't know how to get it. I honestly, I honestly believe that there isn't anything in this world that I need that money can buy or that anything else can buy that I can't get if I want it. I don't think in terms of what I can't get, I think in terms of what I can get. And I've been doing that for a long time, and it's a wonderful thing to, with which to condition your mind to be positive. So that when the circumstances arise where you need a positive mental action, you, you're in the habit of uh, reacting in a positive way at all times, rather than in a negative way. You don't get a mental, positive mental attitude just by wishing for it, you get it by weaving a web, weaving a cord of the rope at a time, day by day, little at a time. You don't just get it overnight. 